It's, it's a joy to greet you and to worship with you. And, and this morning, I, I don't want to do anything to turn the focus from God to man. Um, but through, the, through all that we've been going through um, uh, with uh, the virus and everything, for the first time, we've got some people that are back with us uh, who have, have not been able to be here for uh, very strict medical reasons. But Sandra's here over here, and it's been maybe, yeah, almost two years, a year and a half. Yeah, we've been praying for her as she's gone through her transplant and how God has been faithful, so faithful, and she's kept up and, and just bore testimony after testimony uh, of what God's doing you know, here and uh, even over in Nashville where she uh, had her procedure and she is still being uh, treated. So Lord bless you, Sandra. We continue to pray for you, and we're grateful for your presence here. And also, Georgia, back here in the back corner. And, and, and uh, uh, so, yeah, Paul and Georgia Green, and these folks have kept up with me as, as they've shared prayer requests. Now, let me tell you this. They're not just sitting at home. God is doing things through them. You know, the Greens are leading some Bible studies and, and are involved in international prayer as, rel, as, as well as a strong prayer ministry here. So out of sight doesn't mean out of mind, and God has, been, has certainly been using them. But it's a joy to see you, and if people did a double take, uh, take it in a positive way and not a negative way. There's a group over here that's joined us today uh, in, in honor of Nell. They're not a pastor search committee, so don't you know, give them the stink eye or the evil eye and think, okay, what are all those people doing over here? Uh, they're here to, to, to celebrate today and to worship with us. And so we're grateful. There are uh, several other visitors here with us. I don't call them out, but if you see someone that you don't know, extend to them a hand of fellowship, of encouragement, uh, that God every Sunday is continually at work. We have the opportunity to demonstrate the you before me, and so there's a, there are more tabs on the Vacation Bible School um, bulletin board out there. For those of you who were not here last week and you don't get a chance, don't say, Whew, I don't have to sit, serve or give in vacation Bible school. You have another opportunity. Go out there and pour, pull the tabs. These are the most expensive items, so because you weren't here last week, that's just between you and God, okay? You got to get the, no, they're all reasonably priced. Pull off some of those and then sign that, uh, the, the sheet uh, to let us know who, who took which of the tabs. John has said there's a sign-up sheet for a big party that the seniors are having out at Cove Lake. So you need to sign up and see what everybody else is bringing and um, let them know what you'll be bringing for the 16th, is that it? 14th. Yeah, over at Cove Lake State Park. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet for small groups. There's various options. So please don't rush out without at least making a note and letting us know uh, where you stand on small groups throughout the, the summer. I don't think there's any other opportunities for service or uh, for ministry. Before Mark and, uh, and Barbara come to do our, our call to worship, um, this is Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. Today is, is not Memorial Day, but we don't want to overlook that. You know, originally in 1868, it, this day was known as Declaration Day, or Decoration Day is what it was. Um, 600,000 had died in the Civil War. And it was two years after that that the country said, how do we, how do we not forget what's, what's necessary in order to remember? So from coast to coast in this budding nation, the nation came together, and I think it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they all bowed and, and gave thanks to God because freedom isn't free. And liberty uh, cost the lives of so many. I was startled just in my preparation. 1.2 million. 1.2 million have died. And so it's, it's not a casual reminder. It's not a, but it's a very solemn memorial as we are 
think about those who gave the ultimate price and, uh, for our liberty and freedom. And as we look to the cross, we see that as well. So if you're here this morning uh, as, a, as a, um, a member and a regular attendee, uh, bless you. And if you're a guest, uh, thank you f- that, for your obedience uh, that God has led you our way this morning for a, a very specific purpose and reason. So this morning, Jeremy's going to be leading us in worship. Um, and we'll have the worship before and the sermon will come later. So we'll not just sing one song and then the message. And Mark and Barbara Reinhardt have our call to worship. Lord bless you this morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a special day. This is a special time. It's special for my family as many of us have gathered to celebrate my mother's 87th birthday, which is tomorrow. It's special because as Bill said, this is a Memorial Day weekend and we remember all who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the service of our country. But this time is special because this time is where our church family comes together for worship. This is the call to worship, to come together. You know, oftentimes we get distracted by things that are happening in our lives and it detracts from what goes on in here. Or maybe we get distracted in here because we don't like the music or they don't sing a song we like. Or maybe we don't like what the preacher says or something that he didn't say. But something to remember is, it ain't about us, okay? We're here to worship the Lord, our Savior. With that in mind, here are the verses we've chosen. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. As we open in prayer, We'll take a few moments of silent prayer just so that you can prepare your heart for worship. Pray with me. Oh, Father, you're great. We just thank you for allowing us to be here together as a family. And Father, we just ask you that this morning that you fill this place with your spirit, that as we sing praises that you will that you will love that. Father, I just ask that the, the words of our mouth and meditation of our heart will be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the name, I'm fixed upon it, name of thy redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thine hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger 
One drink from the fold of God, He to rescue me from danger, interposed His precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor! Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And oh, that day when free from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, full arrayed in blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass. For I know thy power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Bring thy promises to pass, for I know thy power will keep me till I'm home with thee at last. My hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, 
All other ground is sinking sand. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, that this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul how sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be so that's right the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the lord, lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul Simply, humbly, it not is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul I even know to ask, bless you, O oh God, praise you, O oh God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that regardless of what is going on around us, um, whether it be disease or war or inflation 
or political turmoil or loss of loved ones, we can sing with all confidence and all hope, it is truly well with our souls because the keeper of our souls has everything in the palm of his hand. And that is a hope that is precious that may we not take that for granted. May we see that more clearly every day as we look to you and your word and in our time with you. May you show us that, reveal that to us because that is the very life force that keeps us going, keeps us on mission, keeps us praying to you, keeps us talking to people about you, keeps us living our lives for you as the hope that no matter what, at the end of all this, we're going to be standing before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's going to say, well done. I pray as as we come to this special day, this Memorial Day, um, there are many here who have give their lives over to military service father we, we are grateful we thank you for the sacrifice that they've made to protect the freedoms that have been afforded to us in this creation that you've given us we pray for the families of those who have family members right now who are on the battlefields on foreign territory protecting the freedoms defending our freedoms May you keep them safe. May you guard them. May you give those families peace of mind knowing that you're in control of all wars at all times. We give you all praise and all glory for everything that you're doing in our lives, everything that you're doing in this church, knowing that it is well with our souls, Father. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed at this time as well. For those of you who still need a note sheet to, uh, to take notes this morning, as God speaks to you, as God directs you, there's some in the back and there's some here in the front. There's no scriptures here, but there are some scriptures over on this side and in the back. Um, our messages always come out of the scriptures, so it's great that you can uh, tune your digital devices, though you can't make notes there. You can tune your, you know, pull up your digital devices or you can follow along uh, in the scriptures. They're black and some of them may be there in the seats, under the seats there, there in front of you. If you're new here, we've been working through the book of Joshua and we've been following the campaign of, of Joshua and the Israelites as God is delivering to them the promised land. We started by watching Joshua uh, work God's plan to occupy and to, to receive the promised land or Israel that God had given them. The first campaign was through the center. They cut uh, Israel in half north to south. They took the central campaign. And so we, we looked to see how, how God established that through Joshua. That was about a two-week-long, historians say that was a two-week campaign uh, through Je uh, Jericho and, and Ai as Israel was divided in order for the Israelites and Joshua to take the southern campaign and then the northern campaign. The southern campaign, historians say, say took about a year. And our scripture has informed us that Adonai Zedek uh, was the, the king um, who led that revolt, who was in that opposition. It's interesting that Adonai Zedek, I didn't tell you that uh, when we covered that, means, means the, the Lord of righteousness. And, and we see that he was anything but that. We'll see that in the name of the king who 
offers the opposition to the north and the northern campaign this morning. His name is Jabin, and that means wise man. And once again, he, he is not a wise man. He's an enemy. He's an enemy of God and the leader of that revolt. But recall that Joshua, who's the key figure here in Israel, Joshua was to Israel what Jesus is to the believer. We've been, we've been seeing that week after week as we come to this book of Joshua. And if you have your scripture, you can turn to Joshua 11. That's where we'll be. We won't be reading the entire chapter this morning. And we're going to see that Jabin is going to launch yet another effort to, to, to defeat the children of Israel. But we can note that where there's always evil forces battling all that God wants to do. And that should never surprise us. When we face resistance, when we face opposition, when we even come against evil, we, we, we should not be surprised. Now, Joshua is a historical book as well as Deuteronomy, which Joshua builds off of. But it's something more than that. It tells the story, it tells the story of redemption. And, and God uses it to prepare the way for our savior there's a song that uh, that cheryl uh, sings not frequently but she sung it often uh, and part of that song says this little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth and fame all right there's a cross and you can win it when you go in jesus name but little is much when god is in it god delights in doing a lot with a little if you feel you're insignificant, well, you're just one person, and you don't feel like you've got a broad ministry, and you don't feel like you, you, know, you have an influence on a lot of people, God can do much with a very little. He delights in guiding His people. He, he delights in protecting His people. He delights in delivering His people. And frequently he does that through tremendous obstacles. Some just happen to come our way. Some things we cause to happen. But nonetheless, he is the victor. And so we, the key lesson from Joshua 11, so that we don't miss it this morning, is this. Is it, we're going to look at, 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 at Israel when they obey God's word. When God's people obeys God's word. And they do his will. They don't just sit back and assume, well, God will be God and I'll be me and everything will work out fine. When they actually do his will and obey his word, they're going to be distinctly different. And because we are distinctly different, what happens is, is the enemies want to come against us. And they, they have and they will and they do. But our God does great exploits. We've seen that throughout Joshua. He is our defender and he fights for us. So let's look at some spiritual principles from Joshua chapter 11 as we continue to watch this campaign, this on the north. So if you have your scriptures, Joshua chapter 11, we'll read verses 1 through 5 first. This is the word, this is the word of the Lord. Yeah, praise be to God. And it came to pass that when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things, we're going to talk about the things that he heard. And he sent to Joab, the king of Madon, to the king of, of Shimron, and to the king of this place, and to the kings who were from the north, kings plural, area vast, and in the mountains, and oh yeah, in the plain of the south, and Chinneroth, and, and over in the lowlands, and up in the heights of Dor to the west. Now, these may sound like generalities to us, but they would be just as specific as we were talking about Duff and, and you know, other areas in Oneida and Huntsville, areas that are right here close by. To the Canaanites in the east, the Canaanites are the <clears throat> bad people, those who are opposing God. In the east and in the west, the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites in the mountains and the Hivites below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, that's these forces, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. 
And you go, well, what in the world are we going to draw out, out, of, out of that, Bill? Here's what we see out of this and what we're going to see when we, when we flesh it out a little bit. We're going to see that our true enemies, our true enemies are not foolish. You think, well, that kind of goes without saying. No, bear with me. Pride and, and lack of Scripture knowledge, it causes us to underestimate the threats in our spiritual life. Too often, when we come against opposition, too often we come against evil, too often when we come against something and we can't explain it, and it's odd towards us, it's because we're a little bit, pr- a lot prideful, and we don't understand the warning of scriptures that, that God would give us before they even arrive. See, at first glance, we, we consider threats not to be all that important. And the demonstration that the threats of the evil one are not is we can get up in the morning knowing we're heading out on a day and we don't even think about, as we talked about last week, putting on the armor of God. Even thinking about the armor of God, much less putting it on. And so we think, oh, I can get through this day, you're marked. I can do this, you're marked. No problem, you're, you're marked. Our enemy, our true enemies, they are not foolish. That is exactly the way Satan would want us to start our day. Self-righteous, self-independent, self-righteous. Last week we saw that there were five kings who formed an alliance. And they were smart because anybody before that who attacked Israel failed miserably and were annihilated. So they thought, well, we'll get the Gibeonites. We'll, we'll, we'll hit Israel by taking back the control of the central part of the country by, getting the, by, by overtaking the Gibeonites who had sided and, and fraud, fraudulently been spared from destruction. But we see, but we see here, it came to pass. It came to pass. What came to pass? Total destruction of the Southern Alliance. That's what came to pass. And the people who were not in the north and, and those who still existed and hadn't been destroyed yet, they knew that. So if you look at everybody who's come against the children of Israel, and they've all been wiped out except the fraudulent Gibeonites, what are you going to do if you're still alive and you know you're next? What are you going to do? Well, you got two options. You can, you can give up and go into hiding and hope the Israelites can't find you. Or somebody else is a bigger threat than you are. Or a bigger target than you are. So that's one thing you can do. Go into hiding. Two is you can try to seek peace. But these in the northern kingdom, which is going to, northern province, which we're going to read about in a minute, they knew that, that they were marked because of what was said in Deuteronomy by Moses. They could not seek peace. And they couldn't fraudulently do what the Gibeonites had done. So if they can't flee and they can't hide, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to fight. They determine. They're not just, well, this is all we've got. They have resolved that they're going to fight Joshua and Israel. And so this king, Jabin, he sent runners all through the north. And he goes anywhere, every nook and cranny. He says, we've got to get together and we've got to, we've got to fight. We've got to come together. This, this has not been tried yet. We haven't had a unified force this large to come against these Israelites and against God. And so verse 4 says, so they went out, they and all their armies with them. Many, many people. And these are forces, trained forces, there are many, so many, as, 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 they're like the sands on the seashore. There's a multitude. Now, did God know this was building up? He, sure, he certainly did. And so what's his first message to Joshua? As it's been all throughout the book, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Your, your faith in me, do not fear. Do not fear. When they see a, 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 a vast group at the Sea of Miram, which we'll read about in a minute, and it was so vast, you just, it just looked like just a, nothing but the sea, the sands on a seashore. Easy, it would have been easy to be feared, fearful. Chapter 10, Adonai Zedek, he rallied five kings, unsuccessful. And so now we see as many as probably 20 to 25 kings in the regions that they're over, they're coming together to fight. 
Now, on any other day, these 19 or 20 kings hated one another. You want me to do that? I'm going to do that. You want me to say this? I'm going to say that. I mean, these kings would not have gotten along in any other way, but this day they unite because they've got a common enemy, and that's Israel. And verse 10 tells us, though we haven't read it, that the head of those kingdoms, the head of all these kingdoms that are coming against the Israelites was Hotzor. And so this king, Jobin, is the, the leader of this pack, and it's a massive show of force. There's a lot of kings. The kings didn't say, okay, I'll send my men. I'm staying here in hiding. The kings went too. So they sent their king. The kings went. They rallied. There were trained soldiers. There weren't men, women, and children to add to the numbers. These are all trained so soldiers. And there were more than could be counted. And this, would have, this display would have made a very seasoned warrior, a, a seasoned uh, um, person, swallow hard. It's a few of us against a lot, a lot of them. Verse 4 says that there were many people, and we, there were very many horses, and there were very many chariots. Josephus is a historian who writes and chronicles history. He said that there could have been easily more than 300,000 infantrymen in this battle at the Sea of Merom, in this plain that they're, where they're going to have this battle. Not only that, there were 10,000 ca cavalry, not cavalry, cavalry, and there were 20,000 chariots. I mean, this isn't a little skirmish, folks. The true enemy is not foolish. He tried it with a few. Now he's going to attempt it with many to keep Israel from possessing or, 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 or knocking them off the land that they were squatting on that was God's land. How do we, what, what's the demonstration? They're not foolish. Jabin says this, we're going to fight, but we're going to fight in order, so we're going to all get together. And so they all got together in a very, very strategic place here at the waters of Merom. And so there, there's assets, there's troops, there's trained troops, and they have technology, you have these horses, and, and they have these, these chariots. And they're all coming together, not just to mass a force. Here's where they're coming together. We're going to all come together because normally we're in it. We're going to come together and we're going to plan. And so here's our plan. We're going to work our plan. And we're going to organize. We're not just going to do what seems right in our own eyes. We're going to organize for success and for victory. We're going to communicate with one another, though we hardly ever speak with one another, especially civilly. We're going to encourage one another. We can do this. We, we, we're not going to be defeated. They had a strategy. In every war, there's a strategy. It's never haphazard. And so they went back and studied previous battles, and they, they're going to intimidate. They're, they've come together to intimidate the children of Israel. Our enemy's not foolish. And so you're thinking to yourself right now, well, I'm not foolish either. I understand what you're talking about. Okay, if we understand that, simple question. What is your greatest enemy in your life right now? Uh, uh, oh, okay, yeah, well. I wonder if you can say right now, clearly and distinctively, what the greatest enemy in your life is. Well, let's parse that. Pastor, how are you talking about? Are you talking about one of my neighbors? Are you talking about somebody who just doesn't like me? I'm talking about who, who wants to see your failure? What in your life have you still allowed that would cause you failure if people knew about it? See, we think, oh, yeah, no, well, yeah, we understand our true enemy is not foolish, but yet we can't even recognize and identify the greatest enemy in our own life. Warning. Be careful. Cheryl and I were talking about this, not because she says, you know, she, she even knew that I was going to be talking about this in the message. And so she, we were talking, and so, and so she kind of, oh, wait a minute. Men, I know you, none of your wives ever do that, say anything, where you act like it just was like, okay, it's okay, no big deal. I'll get milk at Walmart when I go. Just, just something really matter of fact. But she said, you remember what you said? She said, it's a cell phone.
I would say that probably the cell phone is the greatest enemy of some here and many out there. No greater evil rushes into our ears and our eyes and our heart that doesn't pass through a little screen. I won't, I, won't, I won't watch that video. I, I, won't, I won't see that. I won't read those. T- I, I won't do that. I'm not going to respond like that. Our true enemies are not foolish. But that's what they want us to think. That's the first acid test for us. Do we consider our enemies foolish? Things not to be considered. If we can't name it quickly, then that needs to be one of our, our immediate prayers. Lord, show me, show me what enemies, what threats are in and upon and around my life that I haven't identified yet that I need to. That with your grace and your, and your mercy, you can help me identify. And not that we eradicate it, but the grace of Almighty God helps us to identify it and to deal with it. Don't ignore your enemies, is what we learned through the Red Sea rules. Don't ever ignore your enemies, because God helps you to identify them as your enemies, as a part of His grace and His warning. And then we cry out to Him to help us to deal with that. Secondly, we look at verse 6. We stopped in verse 5, secondly in verse 6. But the Lord said to Joshua, God's going to get involved. God says... He doesn't imitate, he doesn't, he doesn't leave, he says. He says to Joshua, and there it is, don't be afraid because of them. That's not casual, that's not idle. God knows anybody that sees what they're getting ready to see is going to be much afraid. And he says, don't be afraid of them, because I'm telling you this, for tomorrow at this time, I'm going to deliver them slain before Israel. Oh, you say that now, God, right? Is that what that, you're just telling us this. The second point, the second principle we see is we need to recognize, as we do clearly in this text, we need to affirm, we need to agree with God, and we need to rest upon His His divine certainties. You mean promises? Yeah, but there are divine certainties. And they're present in our life all the time, not just when we're going through difficulties. The Lord says to Joshua, don't be afraid of them. He's reminding Joshua, you're going to want to walk by faith tomorrow, but we're not going to do by by sight tomorrow, but but you need to walk by faith. You need to trust my character, and you need to trust my word. I just told you what I'm going to do, and I've told you what you're not going to do. And don't be afraid. Remember, When they got there, they were not a trained troop. They didn't have horses, and they certainly didn't have these chariots. So they're going to get there and see uh, 50 to 1 more people and all this technology and resources which they don't have. Don't be afraid. Because I'm going to show up tomorrow and do something for you. When God speaks, He speaks truth, always. God is not a God of suggestion. He's a God of truth. When He speaks truth, He always does so with absolute authority. He's sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. So He speaks truth with authority, and He does so in assurance. And our assurance is not in our hearing. Our assurance is in His character and who we know God to be. And so those are, those are what we would consider the divine certainties. We know certain things. When I pray, God listens. Now, sometimes it may seem like he doesn't respond, but when we pray, God listens. That's a divine certainty. We should pray always without ce- ceasing. That's a divine certainty. There's so many others that bring comfort and peace and strength and hope and joy when we, when we discern these certainties of God. But see, God knows that worry and anxiety keep us from trusting God and His goodness and His ways and His will. So He has to come back and keep telling us, now don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
You see, fear is a natural, it's a, it's, a, it's a God-given response that causes us to seek God and to trust Him and His promises. When we're fearful, when, we're, when we don't know what to do, the first thing that we should do is, is, is run to God and say, God, I'm fearful. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to interpret this. God, help me. God, show me. God, speak to me. Run to God. And he'll, he'll begin to reveal to you that just the divine certainties. Interesting, I didn't read the latter part of, of verse 6. He says, tomorrow don't be afraid because I'm going to deliver them over slain before Israel. But oh yeah, you're going to do something too. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Here's what I'm commanding you to do. Hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. How does that command settle with you? What in the world God's, is God up to by asking the Israelites to hamstring their horses? I mean, cut the tendons of their horses. It didn't completely debilitate them. It just kept them from being useful in battle. Hamstring the horses. God, we don't have time to do that. You see, there was all these, all these Canaanites we're going to destroy. We ain't got time to mess with the horses. We ain't got time to burn all these. What, what, what's, what's up with this, God? Why, why are you giving us this busy work? This is not some ancient war strategy that we don't understand because they don't have all the technology that we have now. That's not it. It's a faith strategy. And here it is. God didn't want Joshua to keep this military equipment and horses for himself. Because he knew, what I've got for you to do, that's going to be in your way. You don't need that. But common sense says, I'm going to save it, and I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it back out on them. God says, no, no, you trust me. Isaiah 31.1, do we have that? Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Going down to Egypt means really disregarding God and his ways. And you're going to rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are many. They are very strong. But who, does, who, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord? As long as I've got a horse, I'm going to ride that horse till it drops, not God. As long as I've got a chariot, I'm going to use this chariot till it just won't go anymore. I'm going to use something that we think is an asset, but God says really it's a liability. He does that in our life frequently. When he says let go, he's not being cruel. He's not being hateful. He's not being contrary. He's saying that's, not, that's going to be in your way. That's something you're not, that's not going to help you as, you as you learn from me how to be like me. You see, these Israelites, we have to recognize they were not a fighting force. They didn't have all these resources that the Canaanites did. They were very little. They couldn't stand against the kings and their mighty, and their mighty armies unless God gave them the victory. You say, okay, that's true. And that's what God does in verse 6. We can't overlook. Don't be afraid because tomorrow I'm going to deliver them. Well, good. All of them, every single one of them over to you. Don't miss this certainty that God has said and he will do. What is the proof to Joshua that says, okay, God, you said, uh, you said it, that settles it. Not I believe it, you said it, that settles it. Everything else God had done in the other battles. See, God took the victory, and all he had done in all those other battles at Ai, at Jericho, with, with Adonai Zadak, and down in the southern campaign, and he used everything he had done. He said, remember that? Now let's go on. He's going to continually use that, and so they're going to learn from previous battles do we learn from the previous battles in our life? I don't mean physical things. I mean spiritual things. I mean moral things, ethical things. Do we learn, say, boy, I'm not going to go back there again. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to. Sure we do. We don't learn from our past. Victory and success in spiritual warfare is due to God's faithfulness. And our trust in God and his promises or his divine certainties and we have to know them to cling to them. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots. That's what uh, these uh, Jabin's forces did. And some trust in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. 
the name of the Lord our God will, will not be defeated. And so God permits in, in, in this battle, and He permits it in our lives, enemies to come against us so that we can learn to trust Him. So we can, so we can, we can walk in His promises and we can look to Him to victory. Job learned that. Jonah learned that. When we walk through the Red Sea rules in Exodus 14, we, we saw that Moses knew that. Matthew 26, we see that the Lord Jesus even reflects that. God doesn't want us depending on ourselves and our own resources for victory. Because we so easily stumble off into pride and self-sufficiency. But he wants, to, he wants us to be totally dependent upon Him. We've, we've built into our lives too many false assurances. Money, intelligence, health, success. What else is on my list here? Self-righteousness. Those are things that give us false assurances. I got money in the bank. I'm looking pretty good. There's not a lot of problems in my life. Things are going good. It's a false assurance. The only hope and, and, and assurance that we truly have, that we truly have as disciples of Christ, is a personal relationship with Him. Walking in the gospel and the strength of the gospel every single day. And we should say boldly and faithfully, apart from Him, I can't do any good thing. Thirdly, we're going to see the results of God's faithfulness. Verse 7. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly, suddenly, surprise attack, ambushed by the waters of Merim, and they attacked them. When I read that, it's, I mean, it just jumped off the page to me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean these few comes against these massive force of 300, and they're going to attack them. That's, what, that's exactly what they did. They, 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 launched an, they launched an attack, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Israel who defeated them and chased them to the greater Sidon and to the brook at Misrephoth and to the valley of Mitzpah eastward. They attacked them until they left none of them remaining. Verse 9, so Joshua did to them as the Lord told him. He hamstrung their horses and he burned their chariots with fire. Obedience to the word of God as they experienced the faithfulness of of God. There's absolute victory here. This is not a partial victory. With very little, he's bold to go attack all of these forces. I don't know how it all played out, but I know this God was glorified. He takes the offensive. He's outnumbered. He's outmanned. He's outtrained. And they found out that that little is much when God is in it. Verse 8, it says that he delivered them until none were left remaining. That's not a small, that, that's not just in there for filler. W what we learn here is this. Though God had promised Israel would be victorious, they never stopped fighting. They didn't stop and say, okay, I'm just going to sit here and camp out for a while and watch what God's doing. They fought and they fought and they fought and they pursued these troops 20, 30, 40 miles until God defeated every single one. So here's the spiritual truth, and it kind of stuck with me. Just because the enemy runs doesn't mean they're beaten. Just because the enemy runs, just because he flees, just because we can't see him, just because it's not a present threat doesn't mean that that enemy's been beaten. God demands total obedience. What God says, how he instructs, how he guides and leads us, we need to be obedient. Verse 9, so Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. Joshua ensured that the people of Israel obeyed the word of God. And so they did hamstring the horses and they did burn the chariots. And there were many, many thousands of horses they had to hamstring. 20,000 chariots that they had. I wonder what the lesson was for them as they went through that process in obeying God. Reluctance, 
dirty work. God always blesses obedience. Always. God's victory and his dominance over powerful enemies, enemies demonstrated the greatness of God. Demonstrated the greatness of God and the promises of God and the surety of God. The faithfulness of God. That was the result of their obedience. Verse 10 and 11. This is going to appear historical, okay, and kind of geographical, but bear with me. And so they struck all the people who were, who were in it with the edge of the sword. They actually, they were the agents through whom God worked. They utterly destroyed them. You mean they destroyed them? Yeah, utterly. And that there was none left breathing. These aren't just euphemisms. And then they burned hot sore with fire. These, these historical, geographical details can change truth and encouragement. If we could go back and look, and we would see that Hotzor was the Washington, D.C. at that time of Israel. It was where everything happened. This was the center, the, heart, the, the heartbeat of the promised land. They were like, the, Hotzor was like the queen on the chessboard. It could have moved in any direction and with absolute power gone anywhere it wanted to go. And that's where Joshua went. He went to Hotzor. To the city and to the king that was instigating this uprising. And everybody would have said, that'll be the last city that'll fall. He'll be the last king that'll be destroyed. And he was. He was the last of 20. And they killed him and they destroyed Hatzor. And they burned it to the ground, but they didn't burn the other cities. It's important. They burned Ai, they burned Jericho, but they also burned Hatzor. And God's going to make an example of this great city. And he does so by, by just devastating it with fire. And so why did he do that? To demonstrate his power and authority. Anybody saw that smoke rising new? The God of the Israelites did that. The greatest city that should have never fallen has fallen. The most powerful king has fallen. How great is this God and so God showed Israel to his glory and enemies to their shame who he is. And here was the message. If Hazor could fall, any city can fall. If Jabin can be died, it can die, will die, any king can die. Fear entered the hearts of the people. All the cities of all those kings, God utterly destroyed. And they were, it does so by as they were commanded in Deuteronomy 20. 400 years earlier, it was told this would happen, and now it's happening to these Amorites and these Canaanites who are squatting in God's holy land verse 12 and 13 so the cities of those kings and all their kings joshua took and struck by the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them just as moses the servant of the lord had commanded centuries earlier and as for the cities that stood on the mounds israel burned none of them except Hazor only which joshua burned god's faithful joshua and israel obeyed as they were commanded and God gave them victory over the kings and over the cities, and he even gave them the spoils, the faithfulness of God. Do you find God faithful in your battles? Do you find God faithful when you run to him and call to him? Well, let's close by looking at some, some somber truths. We're not going to leave it with predominantly this historical and geographical and, and, and military um, emphasis. Look at verse 20. We didn't read verse 20, but it's important. It says, for it was, for it was, this is the summary of his, his conquest. It says, for it was the, the Lord, it was of the Lord to harden the hearts of these Canaanites, that they should come against Israel in battle, and that he, God, might utterly destroy them, the Canaanites, and that they might receive no mercy and that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. Utterly destroy, receive no mercy, absolute destruction, total annihilation. 
For 400 years, that was the message that went out to these people who were fighting against Israel. They knew what was coming. Now let me tell you, this is Holocaust proportions. This is horrendous what we read here. And it should be. It should, it should garner our attention. It should alert us. It should awake us. This is no casual thing. But let me tell you, this is not a Holocaust. Scripture, if we go back to Deuteronomy, tells us this is a holy war. This is a just war. God has given them 420 years to repent and to come to Him. Seven times already in Joshua we read about this. The people heard what God was doing. You know what? 400 years ago something was said and now it's coming to fruit and they keep hearing it again and again and again and again. God's going to wipe us out because we're squatting on His land and we're serving other gods and we have idols, and we've completely rejected God. So what did they hear? For all? They heard God's merciful. They heard God's gracious. Things that we hear, things that lost neighbors hear, things that people you work with who are lost hear. God's gracious. God's forgiving. God is sovereign. God is patient. God is kind. God is just. But the same God is holy, and He's wrathful against evil. And so they heard all about God, but here's what they did. They resisted. Except Rahab. Remember Rahab? Except the Gibeonites. Remember the Gibeonites. Not all resisted. But we see these in the north, they trusted in chariots. They trusted in horses. They trusted in all their ingenuity and their implements of war. And that led them to turn to godlessness and idolatry and human sacrifice. And so they chose to reject the grace of God. That's the goodness of God. That's, that's all the, the characteristics of God. The goodness of God. God giving them what they don't deserve. And then they, they, they rejected God's mercy, not God, not God give it, not giving them what they do deserve for 420 years. He kept patiently and lovingly calling them to himself. And so when they rejected God's grace and they rejected God's mercy, it's the same today. All we have left is, is justice. And that's where we get what we deserve. And that's what they receive. So here's the heart of the text. The utter and total defeat of Canaanites pales in comparison. Everything that we've been reading, and this has been horrible stuff that we've read, is just hundreds of thousands have died, and we've seen the brutality of it. But that pales in comparison to what's going to happen when the eastern sky parts and the Lord Jesus descends and he comes to judge the people. It's going to be it's going to be a hundred times worse. Oh, it can't be any worse. Oh, but it is, and that's what we're being warned about here. Oh, dear people, he's going to judge the world. He's going to raise the dead, but he's going he's to make all things new. But it's going to be it's going to be horrendous. Do you have Hebrews 4, 7 through 10? Yeah. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts like these Canaanites did so if something wants to wash over you if there's something here that might might really the spirit of god might use it with great power this morning it's this everything that we've been reading here is only a dress rehearsal we have weddings here and people come and they have a rehearsal it's not a dress rehearsal but it, 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 it is a rehearsal and then we do everything just like it's going to be on the, the actual day that we, we finalize things, exchanging of the rings. But here this is only a dress rehearsal because there's, a, there's an ultimate Sabbath rest that's to come, and that's the glory that God has prepared for us. Joshua couldn't see the greater Joshua, who's the Lord Jesus Christ. He couldn't see that. Through Jesus and his death on the cross, God conquered our greatest enemy. And so if it hadn't come to you yet, know this. Of everything I've talked about, there's a lot of enemies. But here's your greatest enemy. It's guilt, and it's sin, and it's death. And if you don't know that, and, and you've not, there's not been provision made for that, God have mercy on your soul and our souls. 
Christ has defeated that. And that's, that's, that's what we're learning as we walk through Joshua. Last week I asked you, what is your assured, and what is your assurance grounded? What are you building your whole life on that you know is immovable? Personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be, we have to be, have our assurance grounded on, on the one, the, he who is greater, the greater Joshua, who doesn't only do great exploits, but he's conquered sin and death and eternal separation with God. True Sabbath rest. It's only, it's only found in our Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your provision. We, we thank you for divine certainties. We thank you for your word. We, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the Holy Spirit has gathered here today everyone that you intended to hear this message. And so we all leave accountable because God called us here. And so, so we, we leave and we depart to be in obedience, not to a man, but to, to your word. And Lord, your spirit has affirmed these truths to us. So where you have warmed us, oh God, lead us to, to, to obey and to respond to your warnings. Where you have demonstrated to us our, our foolishness or our self-righteousness or our independence, oh God, we confess that to you. And for those here who are, who are lost or or not walking in relationship with you, oh God, would you show them and show us that we would quickly run to you. We wouldn't question your word. We wouldn't parse it. But we would receive it. And so Lord, we thank you for your great love for us that's demonstrated in the gospel and the cross. So as we continue to worship, oh God, Help us to not just put away our notes and assure you that we'll think about this later at another time. But this morning, we would confirm what you've said to us. We trust your provision for us. It's not in us. And apart from you, these Israelites could not have taken the promised land. And apart from you, us living in our lives focused on the gospel, Lord, we, we cannot live holy. We cannot live obediently. We cannot live victoriously, trusting in anything but your grace and goodness. As we sing and worship, O oh God, direct our response to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this closing song together. Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life ah miss that vanishes at dawn oh glory be to glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will never sing. All glory be to Christ. 
His will be done, His kingdom come on earth as is above. I with Himself our daily bread, praise Him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price will take a cup of kindness yet all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ, his rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, all glory be to Christ the King, all glory be to Christ, his rule and reign sing all glory be to Christ last Wednesday uh, one of my youth kids we were sitting in my classroom because they stay after and I give them a ride and uh this kid's an agnostic, and he said, Boshiers, what, what do you think the apocalypse is going to be like? You know, he'd been talking about that with some of his friends. So I explained to him Revelation and, you know, different things in that. And uh, it came to talking about how Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to, you know, establish justice on the earth and bring his righteous rule, and he's going to, you know, have the judgment. And he said, well, what do you think that you're going to get? I said, justice. Justice is what I'm going to get. Right, Because if God is going to come in and cleanse this world, he has to start with me and he has to start with you. And there'll be justice at the cross or justice in hell, but one way or the other, God will be glorified and no sin and injustice will remain. We all live in Canaan. We're all the Canaanites. Don't listen to that story and think that you're, you know, be rushing in and doing these things. We're Rahab. God came for us. We don't deserve mercy and we don't deserve grace. Rahab deserved to die just as much with those wicked people. And we do too. And so let's go to the Lord this morning and let's pray to him and let's thank him for the mercy and grace that he's shown us. And let's remember that God does not send us into the world to judge them and destroy them. That's an image of judgment. And what Jesus sends us with is not the sword, in a sense the sword, but with the word to bring mercy and truth and grace to a world that will perish without him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have not come with the sword of judgment, but you've come in peace and grace. You have sent your son to us. Lord, you've laid our sin on him who knew no sin so that in him we might have your righteousness. Lord God, we are undeserving and we are unworthy. 
Lord God, if you were to bring justice on the earth, you would have to start in this room. No one in heaven will deserve to be there except for Christ. We will be there because we are in him. Lord God, we can't even claim our faith as our own. Lord, we are weak and we are brittle, we are feeble. Lord God, you maintain us and you keep us. You strengthen our weak knees and our weak hands. Father God, we ask you for grace that we would be empowered by the power of your spirit to deliver your word to lost and dying people, Lord. A people who are running around who can't agree on anything. The truths change every year. Lord God, they are lost and they are confused and only Christ can cut through the darkness. So we ask you that we would be bold and we would not trust in our own strength. Lord, we have no chariots. We have no horses. We think we do. We call them intellect. We call them winsomeness, Lord. These are weak. Lord, we need your strength and we need your power. Let us believe that your gospel has the power by your spirit to do what we cannot and is to transform the hearts of sinners, to turn hell-bound haters of God into lovers of Jesus as you have done to us. And so we ask you for that grace this morning to embolden us. And in Jesus' name we ask it. And amen.